The first states on our planet emerged about 5,000 years ago. Variously structured as one type of monarchy or another, they were generally led by a sole ruler with absolute authority. The sovereign wielded a relatively blunt and unsophisticated apparatus of command and control supported by armed forces, with the aim of defending territories and, where possible, conquering new ones. Although rudimentary, it was an effective organizational model for its time. However, over time civilization progressed. Technologies were developed in agriculture, livestock, farming, construction, and metallurgy. Science flourished. The increased complexities of modernized public life required new, more effective management and governance practices. As these mechanisms steer the structure of power and society, the better refined they are, the more harmoniously a state develops, resulting in a higher quality of life for its citizens. Though like anything, it's not a miracle solution. There's a limit to the precision that can be achieved working with a stone axe, and there's a limit to the social development that can be attained under autocracy. Thousands of years of trial and error have proven that a separation of power into branches of government produces better results than even the wisest autocrat could hope for. We've learned that voluntary labor is exponentially more productive than slavery. It's proven that rotating, elected leadership is more effective than long-term reign, and that laws applied equally to all create a safe and predictable environment for sustainable development. In parallel, philosophers and thinkers have pondered, why do states exist in the first place? What are their functions, and what forms of government are the most conducive to prosperity? In 1850, German legal scholar and economist Lorenz von Stein answered, The role of the state is to maintain absolute equality of rights for all social classes, for each individual, to promote the economic and social progress of all its citizens, since ultimately the development of one is a condition for the development of the other. He named this model the welfare state. At first, this may just read as a boilerplate argument for good versus evil, advocating humanism with a distinctly leftist bias. Could it be effectively administered? Turns out that yes, it can. Implementation of welfare state principles allowed the West in particular to recover more robustly from the consequences of the Second World War. And the application of this model even allowed defeated countries to achieve greater prosperity than Eastern Bloc victors. Countries that continued to pursue hollow socialist agendas found only elitism and rigid class division. Everything for the party, leftovers for the rest. Does the application of humanism also require pragmatism? Absolutely. Take healthcare, for example. We treat it purely as a service. The wealthy can afford adequate medical help, while the poor are left with homemade remedies and concoctions, sometimes found growing along the road. In a cynical sense, this may seem fair, but what does this approach lead to? First, incurable disease. HIV, tuberculosis, dysentery, and a huge bouquet of bacterial and viral infections would spread almost uncontrollably, especially among the poor. After all, citizens do not live isolated on different planets. Rates of illness would be higher across all layers of society, so half measures cannot be enough. Everyone must be treated. What about the environment? Air quality can't be specifically improved for individual wealthy households. Everyone breathes the same air, clean or dirty, rich or poor. Obviously, water can be filtered and food can be purchased from better farms and suppliers. But it's impossible to shield oneself entirely from a polluted environment. To one degree or another, everyone is affected. Education is a similar story. If available only to the few, society would be mostly illiterate. Even those who graduate from the best universities would be uncomfortable living there. And intellectually gifted children are born to any family, privileged or not. If we don't provide education for those who can't afford it, how many future Elon Musks fall by the wayside? Let's consider poverty for a moment. It appears that in fighting it, society is driven exclusively by moral and humanistic inclinations. Not entirely. After all, poverty coexists with crime. The lion's share of crime is committed out of necessity, not the pursuit of luxury. 
anyone can fall victim to fraud, theft, mugging, robbery, and murder. And where there is poverty, the environment, education, and healthcare also suffer. They are simply not a priority. It is not an abstract notion to support the weak and disadvantaged, to help them get on their feet, develop, and live a decent life. In fact, it is critical for the development of society as a whole. There's no getting away from that fact. Structural integrity is determined by the weakest link, and government is no exception. As you may have noticed, for years Putin's Russia has been following a different path. It has created a state within a state. The pro-government aristocracy is vigorously isolating itself from the people, with high fences and tinted windows, living in a bubble among its own people. But where do they vacation or invest in real estate? In stronger, prosperous countries with fully implemented welfare state models. That's because it's more comfortable there, cozier, safer, and easier to breathe. Someday, Russia will be that country. Let's remember that the strength of a state in the modern world is not fierce rhetoric, not a repressive apparatus, and not undermining the neighbors. It's the standard of living enjoyed by its own citizens. Everyone, not just a select few. All the best to you.